for America. Now, how about the war on terror? We're all against terrorism, but many of us are concerned that the war on terror has given our government unprecedented powers to spy on its own citizens. And where did the Department of Homeland Security come? A lot of people think it was invented after 9-1-1. It actually came before 9-1-1. It was recommended by the U.S. Commission on National Security, a 12-person task force, nine of whose members were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And what they recommended was what they called a National Homeland Security Agency, the exact words used by President Bush after 9-1-1. <laughs> one uh, question we really have is, who's going to be ultimately defined as a terrorist? Now, one answer to that comes from Anna Quindlin. She's a columnist for Newsweek. After 9-1-1, she uh, published a, uh, a column called The Terrorist Here at Home. And who do you think she was talking about when she said the terrorist here at home? Pro-life movement. Here's what she wrote. She said, there's no real ideological difference between these people, the pro-life movement, and the people who flew planes into the World Trade Center. One of the leaders of Operation Rescue once sent his followers a letter that concluded, return to the training so that God may use you. Sound familiar? What's Quinlan saying here? That the pro-life people should be classified as terrorists. Now, if that happened in the Homeland Security, they could lose their websites, have their assets frozen, be prosecuted without due process, right? There's a connection between the trade agreements and the war on terror. Yes, they're both being used to advocate consolidating the North American countries into one union. Robert Pastor of the Council on Foreign Relations wrote this in Foreign Affairs about security. He said, security fears serve as a catalyst for deeper integration. That will require new structures to assure mutual security. The Department of Homeland Security should expand its mission to include continental security, a shift best achieved by incorporating Mexican and Canadian perspectives and personnel into its design and operation. And so it's coming now, the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America. Most people don't know it. But President Bush has already signed the agreement with President Fox of Mexico and Prime Minister Martin of Canada to begin the process of unionizing, creating a union with Canada and Mexico. And this was missed completely by the mass media, except for Lou Dobbs of CNN, who said this about the new agreement. He said, President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it. And he took the step without approval from either the U.S. Congress or the people of the United States. We are not writing our own foreign policy. Now, by the way, are these regional blocks like the European Union and Security and Prosperity Partnership, are they ends in themselves? No. They're just stepping stones towards world government, which is world tyranny. Joseph Stalin, the dictator of the Soviet Union, understood this principle. Here's what he wrote. Populations will more readily abandon their national loyalties to a vague regional loyalty than they will for a world authority. Later, the regionals can be brought all the way into a single world dictatorship. And to hear it from the Council on Foreign Relations, the big new Brzezinski said this, we cannot leap into world government in one quick step. The precondition for genuine globalization is progressive regionalization. Now that pretty much uh, completes my talk, except I want to touch on one more thing. I'm going to become my own critic again. I'm Mr. Perloff. I've been listening to you talk here uh, all night. And some of the things you say are a little bit interesting. But you know what, Mr. Perloff? There's an easy litmus test by which we disprove everything you've said tonight. See, Mr. Perloff, our founding fathers gave us freedom of the press. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press. So you can be sure there are no big secrets in America. Now, here in America, we have a lot of choices. Uh, you, know, you live up there in Boston, Mr. Perloff, you can read the Boston Globe, but if you don't like it, read the Times or the Post or any other of many major daily newspapers. If you don't like your news in a daily format, Mr. Perloff, you can get it in a weekly format from one of these fine news resources. Or, if you don't like to read Mr. Perloff, and I suspect you don't, you can get it from television news. Now, Mr. Perloff, this is a small sampling of our media marketplace. It's a marketplace of ideas. Now, are you seriously trying to suggest that all the reporters for all these media outlets missed all these stories when missing them? <laughs> I don't think so, Mr. Perloff. You know what? I think you have no credibility. Why should we believe a goofball like you? Well, we can turn to a respected source of news and information like the New York Times. Hmm? I tell you what, Mr. Perloff, I'll believe the stuff you've been saying the day the New York Times prints it. Until then, don't waste your breath on me, huh? All right. What about that? Well, you better believe that an establishment that's powerful enough to control our government and our banks is also powerful enough to run the media. 
And they better be sure they're also smart enough to figure out a long time ago that if they want their agenda passed, they're going to have to control the media that shapes public opinion. Just to take the New York Times as an example, because we're not, this is not a talk on the media tonight. Uh, in the 19th century, the Rothschild sent their agent, uh, August Belmont, who's in the upper left there. That was not his real name. They thought August Belmont would sound pretty classy. And uh, he and J.P. Morgan offered money to Alfred Ox if he would buy a, a newspaper that would represent establishment interest in America. And Ox took that money, and he bought a small newspaper called the New York Times, which at that time had a circulation of just 9,000. But with the power of Rothschild and Morgan behind him, Ox turned the New York Times into the world's most powerful newspaper. He merely moved it to new headquarters, plush new headquarters at what is now called Times Square. He was able to buy famous writers, bring them into the fold, buy up channels of distribution. But I just want to point out the New York Times was not built on integrity, it was built on money. And from Ox, the ownership passed on to Sulzberger, Dreyfus, and Sulzberger, all members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And if you look at the Times editorial history, you'll find they've consistently supported the policies advocated by the CFR. For example, when Paul Warburg was up for uh, vice chairman of the Fed and uh, congressmen were making noises about this guy, the New York Times published an editorial saying what a great patriot he was. The guy next to Fidel Castro there is New York Times reporter Herbert L. Matthews. It was his articles in the New York Times that persuaded Americans that Castro was not a communist, but was actually the George Washington of Cuba. Matthews, member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The man of the lower left, Leslie Gelb, New York Times editor, one of the key figures behind the Pentagon Papers, which demoralized America so much during the Vietnam War. So you might think, well, maybe Gelb will expose the CFR. Not likely. He was its president for 10 years, still as president emeritus. When you talk about the New York Times, in the Council of Foreign Relations, you're talking about two faces of the same institution. They are not going to expose each other. What looks at first like great diversity actually is not. Our Boston Globe up in Boston is owned by the New York Times, just as the Washington Post owns, uh, Post Company owns Newsweek, just as Disney owns ABC News, just as CBS owns the big publisher Simon & Schuster. Um, or take a look at one corporation, AOL Time Warner, owns America Online, Time Magazine, Warner Brothers, CNN, Turner Broadcasting, HBO, Sports Illustrated, 130 magazines not even listed here. If you take all the movie chains and uh, major radio networks, TV networks, major magazines, newspapers, and publishing houses, most of them are owned by about a dozen corporate entities which interlock at the top with membership in the Council on Foreign Relations. My final quote confirming this comes from David Rockefeller himself, who said this at a dinner in 1991. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications and directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion. For almost 40 years, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world from been subject to the bright lights of publicity during these years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government who shall never again know war but only what? Well, that does conclude my presentation. I uh, do want to encourage you, if you're not already subscribing, to the New American...